The simplest case for electromagnetic waves is to examine a single frequency propagating as a plane. Hi, I'm Jonathan Gardner. I'm covering Section 821 of Griffith's Introduction to Electrodynamics, Second Edition. We've just talked about the wave equation, and now we're going to see how electromagnetic waves, specifically, behave in a vacuum. First, we're going to look at what EM plane wave might look like. Before we begin, let's talk about what mo monochromatic means. Mono means one, and chromatos is the Greek for color. So monochromatic means one color. Let me just... What does color have to do with EM waves? Well, it turns out the light of every color is simply an EM wave. This is hardly surprising to us today. But remember how exciting it was to unify the field of optics to the field of electromagnetism back at the turn of the last century. Not only visible light, but all EM waves come in different frequencies. Remember that wavelength and frequency are related. So nu, the frequency, not v, nu, is equal to um, c, the speed of the wave, in this case, speed of light, because we're dealing with vacuum, over lambda, the wavelength. So as the wavelengths, as the wavelengths get longer, the frequencies get, get uh, shorter. And as the frequencies get higher, the wavelengths get shorter. At the very highest frequencies, the tightest wavelengths, we have gamma rays, rays that come from um, decaying radioactive material. Gamma rays, of course, are very dangerous. At lower frequencies, we have x-rays, uh, which we know can be used to see inside of your body. These two are dangerous because they can, um, they can knock electrons off and do different things to the material within your body. Um, ultraviolet light comes next, which is also dangerous, but not as dangerous as x-rays and gamma rays, of course. Um, ultraviolet light lies uh, outside of below ultra, or actually ultra means above, um, so it's higher frequency than violet, which is the most excited visible light that you can see. And you go from violet to, uh, you know, the different colors, um, uh, violet, blue, then you get a green, yellow, orange, and then you get red. And then outside of red lies uh, infrared, near infrared, which is close to visible red, and you have far infrared, which is far away. Uh, infrared is about the wavelengths that you get from uh, material that's about room temperature, something around that rat range, which is why when you heat things up at a fire, you see red. And very hot fires will turn yellow, and then you know, very, very hot fires will, will glow blue. Um, so um, visible light um, has wavelengths of about 400 to 750, uh, 760 actually, nanometers. So 400 uh, are the shortest wavelengths, the highest um, highest frequencies. These are the, the blues and violets, and 760 is the, um, the red light. Okay, after we get past the infrared, we're talking about microwaves. Uh, microwaves can be used, of course, to heat your burritos, but they can also be used for communication, short-range communication. Um, you, then you have your uh, TV and FM, and then beyond that you have what you would what we call uh, AM. I don't even know if people that have been born recently know what AM is. Um, if you're into conservative talk radio, you will certainly know what AM is. And then beyond that, you have longer and longer frequencies of waves that uh, can span not just like the buildings, but they can span mountains and you know wavelengths that can be the size of the entire Earth. Okay, so um, the frequency of your EM radiation is directly uh, corresponding to the color that you see. And although visible light is a very, very thin range of radio waves, all radio waves have a color. Um, the color being, you know, whether they're gamma rays or x-rays or whatever they are. Um, the next thing we learn, um, we learn that in a vacuum, Maxwell's laws can be modified into this form by taking the curl of Faraday's law and Ampere's law with Maxwell's corrections, and or the charge density since they're charge density current since they're zero. So we get the two equations. We get the Laplacian of the E field is equal to one over C squared times the second derivative with respect to time uh, of the E field, and the same thing for the B field equals one over C squared times the second derivative with respect to time of the B field. Okay. So um, there are different, different ways to satisfy this equation. Um, one of them that's interesting is spherical, 
and spherical actually corresponds in, to many real world scenarios so I think there's a problem in the back of the book that he talks about that you can solve uh, not terribly difficult but it is fun to solve um, this uh, we're going to talk about plane waves the reason why is the math is a lot easier it's a lot easier to think about too um, plane waves are waves which travel in a single direction we'll align it with the x-axis so we have our y uh, our Z, I'm trying to make sure we're following the right hand rule and the X. So the wave is traveling in this direction. That's the velocity of the wave C. Of course, it's speed of light. Um, the YZ planes that travel with this wave will all have the same E and B fields. There is no Y or Z dependence in either the E or B fields. Or in other words, um, we can write our E and B fields as in this form. So we can say E, E vector, depends only on the x position and the time, and that's going to be equal to some E naught vector times, uh, well, it's the real part of this, E to the I kappa x minus omega t. So the real of that, so yeah, you understand. I'll just put complex notation on top here. And the same for the B field. The B field, it depends on x and t, doesn't depend on y or z, is same as B vector complex e to the i kappa x minus omega t, the B naught, yeah. So really there's, there's three numbers that we worry about. One is these e naughts and the B naughts, and then of course kappa and omega. Kappa and omega have to do with the frequency or the wavelength of the wave. Um, the so we, we talked about complex notation earlier hopefully you're more comfortable with it now um, hopefully you've solved some of the problems that go with this the the important part that I want you to remember is that only the real parts are actual the complex part represents something different um, we can just ignore it okay but the real you take the real of these functions and you'll get the actual E and B fields so um, the um, What's a complex vector? I don't want you to think too hard about this, but a complex vector basically has a complex number in the x direction, a complex number in the y direction, and a complex number in the z direction for a total of, of six dimensions. Plus we have the dimension of time. So really we're dealing in seven dimensional space, but I don't, I don't want you to, to think too hard about that. Just, just kind of, we're doing the math for it, just kind of gloss over it and move along. Maybe one day you'll understand better what complex numbers really are or you'll have some mental crutch that you'll use it that'll be good for you, but right now it's not important. <clears throat> anyway, the phase constant, as you remember, is, is embedded within these complex numbers here, um, delta. So we can write our E naught, the complex one, is equal to some real E vector, E naught, times E to the I delta, which is the phase constant. So uh, same for the B. So. Anyway, Maxwell's law says that the divergence of, um, so the, the complex fields obey Maxwell's laws. And the reason why that is, is if you took the imaginary part of these numbers, you're basically taking whatever you would have had times cosine, now you're multiplying by sine of the same thing. And, you know, sine, whatever, it, everything integrates and deriv uh, derives the same way. So we can basically apply Maxwell's laws to complex fields and, and everything will work out. Um, the only thing we really need to satisfy is that for the reals, everything works. Uh, it, nobody cares about the complex point. Nobody cares about the, the imaginary part of the numbers, just the reals. So uh, the first rule we have is the divergence of the E field is zero um, of the complex E field, and we're gonna have the divergence of the B field. Complex B field also be zero. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, um, this means the divergence of this this dude right here, so we have E not. this is a constant, it doesn't vary with X or time, it's the same everywhere, times E to the I kappa X minus omega T has to be equal to zero, okay? And uh, so when we take the, the, the divergence, well that's D by DX of the X component, D by DY of the Y component, and D by, D, wait, that's not correct. The divergence, is um, that's right it is d by dx plus d by dy plus d by dz of the x y and z components um, so we have to have this all equal to zero so d by dx 
of this thing e to the i kappa x minus omega t has to be equal to zero and d by dy of the same um, and I'm I apologize for my handwriting in advance and that has to be equal to zero and the d by dz of e e to the i kappa x minus omega t has to also be equal to zero. We're dealing in, in a vacuum here with no free space. Now, if if you look closely at this and, and you don't let yourself get carried away um, thinking too hard about complex numbers, so this is a constant. So the derivative of this is always zero. Okay, um, e to the i k x uh, e minus omega t. Well, you know d by d y of this. There's no y or z dependence here, so this automatically has to be zero. That's that's pretty straightforward. The only condition we get is that this derivative over here has to equal zero, and so that gives us um, i e naught complex vector e to the i. Oh, I have to bring out the kappa. This has to equal this. Okay, so basically. Um, um, where's I lost my space in my notes here? Unless e not x is zero, the law will not be satisfied. So we see that there can be no x component of the e not vector. So um, this is the x component. I'm sorry. Uh, notation time of the x component of the y component of the z component, and so this has to be zero. Well, kappa isn't zero i isn't zero, so this guy has to be zero. This is the x component. So e naught and the x component has to be equal to zero. So that's why I told you that e naught, this e naught vector or the electric field has to point in the y or z direction. It can't point in the x direction. Okay, and the same reasoning goes for the b field because the divergence of the b field has to be equal to zero. Okay, same logic. You know, just automatically the derivative of this is going to be zero, so you don't have to constrain anything to get the y z um, the derivative to be zero. But you do have to do something to get the x derivative to be zero. Namely, you have to say that there is no x component to that that field. Uh, at this point, I'm going to take a break um, and come back. I think it's been about 10 minutes. It has. It's been 12 minutes, and I'll come back and continue the discussion in part two. Thank you for your time.